the Wheel of Time community, and welcome to the Wheel of Time pod through. I'm Teresa. And I'm Tim. And together we're going to walk through Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time book series. How you doing, Tim? Um, I'm a little snarfly, so I apologize if, my, if, if I'm a little sniffly throughout this episode, but otherwise I'm doing good. All right. Uh, we have some housekeeping to discuss before Ooh. we get into it today. Okay. So next week, we will finish the last two chapters of The Eye of the World. Wow. And then after that, so on January 28th, we will be posting a wrap-up episode for book one with a Q&A session. So that means we need your questions. Ask us anything and send them to either our email, which is wattpodthrough at gmail.com, or tweet at us at wattpodthrough. If you can get them to us this week, that would be best. Send us your cues, and we will give you our A's. So before we get started, we just want to remind you that this is a reread. We assume that you've read the entire series, so there will be spoilers. You have been warned. All right, Tim, what are we going to be doing in today's episode? Today, we'll be discussing chapters 50 and 51 of The Eye of the World, where it's time to get down to business and save the world. Let's start with chapter 50 which is called Meetings at the Eye, and we have the leaf icon. Here's a quick summary of Chapter 50 to act as a reminder for those of you who are not reading along with us. The immense fielders are in awe and wonder at the green man, a living legend right in front of them. The piece of the garden acts as a bomb after the events of the previous chapters, and the green man weaves flowers to adorn the women's hair. He tends his garden and talks as he leads them to the eye. He explains how the eye was made, and his feelings that this is the end. The group heads through an archway to a cavern where they find a large oval-shaped pool, the eye of the world. Moraine explains that it was the pure essence of the male half of the power. She says that no one living knows why or how it was created, just that it would be needed when the world was at its most desperate. The Aes Sedai who made it knew they would die to work through the taint of the Dark One and make it pure, and only a male Chandler can use it. Rand demands to know why she brought them there, and she tells them that the Dark One's power will strike here, and he must be confronted and stopped. No one is comfortable about any of this, and Marine suggests that they go back up into the sunlight. Once back outside, a voice says, I have found you at last. They are confronted by two men who say that Matt led them there, or more accurately, the dagger did. But he is not the one they seek. They pull back their hoods, and one is shriveled and ancient, while the other has his face covered by a mask made to look like a young man laughing insanely. The withered one introduces himself as Agenor, and the other is Balthamel, two of the Forsaken. Matt starts to say the catechism. The Forsaken are bound in Shaogul, but Agenor interrupts him. He tells them that they were bound, but the seals weaken, and some are bound no longer. These two were bound too close to the world, and the grinding of the wheel over 3,000 years messed them up, but the Dark One will give them new bodies. Lan prepares to attack, but is torn between Moraine and Nynaeve, not sure who to protect. Agenor takes advantage of Lan's hesitation and flings the warder aside. Nynaeve attacks in retaliation, and Balthamon grabs her by the throat and lifts her up while Agenor makes lewd threats. Rand tackles Egwin before she can make her move on the Forsaken, while Matt and Perrin try to save Nynaeve. They get swatted down like flies, but their Two Rivers stubbornness has them back on their feet as soon as they are able. The Green Man is like, oh, hell no, not in my house, and Balthamel drops Nynaeve like a rag and sets the Green Man on fire. While he burns, the Green Man wraps his arms around Balthamel, crushing him. Creepers and fungus grow over and through him, tearing him apart. As a final act, the green man uses the last of his power to turn an acorn into a large old oak tree to mark his own tomb. Moraine steps up to bat and attacks Agenor, telling the others to run. Matt, Perrin, and Loyal take off, but Rand sees Egwin standing there trying to throw her puny power at Agenor as well. He pushes her hard and shouts at her to run. She finally does, but they have caught Agenor's attention. Rand turns to run, and behind him, he can hear Moraine start to scream. The Green Man is really cool. He reminds me of what a hippie may be like if they had magical nature powers. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to finally get a moment of true peace and serenity after running from the horrible experience in the Blight. Mm-hmm. 
But the fact that we have a moment of peace after such a hard-pressed run away from danger should be our clue that something big is about to happen. Yeah, it's like the eye of the storm, kind of. Yeah. So, Jordan is sneaky with his use of unreliable narrators. Oh, okay. We can't trust everything our characters tell us, even the main ones. Um, Rand thinks to himself, the thousands of burning points piercing his bones had winked out at the very moment he came within the green man's domain. He was sure. It's him that winked them out, he thought. The green man and this place. But no, actually. Like, we already discussed this in the last episode, that this was Rand trying and failing to graph Sedin. He right. just doesn't know that yet. So don't trust everything you read. That's good advice for the Wheel of Time and elsewhere. You mean... Robert Jordan maybe be misleading us on some things? A few things. The Green Man's speech about how he keeps the faith is really sad and beautiful all at the same time. Like, he guarded the eye of the world for ages, even though he was not intended for the task. Mm -hmm. He was compelled by the need of the world to take up the mantle of protector. This says so much about who he is, and we know his life is probably at an end now that the eye needs to be used. Mm -hmm. The eye was made by a hundred Aes Sedai, both male and female, joining forces to pool pure, untainted Sedin. They knew that getting through the Dark One's power would kill them, but they knew that the world would need it. The Green Man explains that the greatest Aes Sedai work was always done by joining the male and female halves of the source. Yeah. Balance, men and women working together as one is a major theme throughout the entire series. This seems to be something that was really important to Jordan because he did everything he could to drive it home. Yep. In Jordan's universe, what men or women can accomplish on their own is nothing compared to what they can accomplish together. It's true. Like, I, and it's one of the things I love about this series. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, like, um, especially since he started it in the 90s. Right. So from like a social standpoint, um, you know, during the 80s and 90s, women were gaining a lot more power um, as far as like uh, shattering glass ceilings and um, being, you know, recognized, recognized and and really going further in their careers. And, um, you know, the battle of the sexes, quote unquote, was kind of coined during that time. Um, and you know, this was Jordan's response to that, I think, to be like, no, 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 you guys, we shouldn't be battling each other. We need to work together, yin and yang. Like we have to work together because if we're just battling each other, we're never going to reach our potential, you know, like men and women need each other, Right. you know, like we as a society, and this has nothing to do with like relationships or romance or whatever. But just as a humanity, like, you can't get rid of half of your species. Right. You know? Like, um, as far as working together, we need each other because both men and women bring different qualities to the table. Yes. You know? Yeah. And when you only have men or you only have women, it's never going to work long term, you know? Like... We just have to look at history that when men are the ones in charge and women are sort of shunted to the side, things fall apart. And the same would be true if only women were in charge and men were shunted to the side. Mm -hmm. We need to be equal together. And Jordan did a lot in this series to try to prove that over and over again. I think he does successfully, too. Yeah, absolutely. The green man leads him to the eye but doesn't go in. And he tells them... When you come out, I will see you again if there's time. He also says that he knows an ending when it comes. This is a big tip to the reader that shit is about to get serious. Right? Yeah. Like, I don't know how prescient the green man is, but he certainly sounds like he has some idea of what is to come. I think think he... Because he mentions, like, he has memories that he can't quite remember, uh-huh. and he touches the scar. So he, he probably, at one point, knew exactly what was going to go on. He may not remember right now. Well, I don't know that it's necessarily a memory thing. Um, like, I think the scar from the breaking uh, messed with his head so that he doesn't have a clear, linear memory, kind of like when you have a stroke. Okay. 
Um, it like his cerebral pathways got interrupted by the breaking of the world of things that have already happened. Yeah, in the past. Got it. Okay. But this, I think, is him having some sort of uh, future knowledge. Like maybe not necessarily being able to see the future or foretelling, but sort of a certain Sense. amount of precognition or, or prescience of. He may not know exactly what's happening, but he can feel the winds changing. Like he can got feel it. that. Um, the 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 end is nigh, and uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like yeah. he, he can feel that that bad is about to happen. When Rand asks Moraine why she brought them to this place, her response is as cryptic as ever. Because it's Moraine, right? So <laughs> here's what she says: Because you're Tavarin, because the Dark One's power will strike here, and because it must be confronted and stopped, or the shadow will stretch over the world. I'm convinced that Maureen knows that Rand is the Dragon Reborn at this point. Like, she brought them here because the three are Tavarin, but also because she knew one of these three could use the Eye of the World to start the Dark One and get to it first. So, you think she knows for sure that it's Rand? Because she knows one of them is the Dragon, but do you think at this point she's narrowed it down to Rand? I'm fairly certain. I mean, Perrin's obviously manifesting the brother, the, like the wolf brother talent. Mm-hmm. Matt's got the Mashadar dagger, so the world's kind of messed up if he's the dragon. I mean, well, I, she might actually be hoping it's Rand at this point. Maybe, yeah. So that's just that's that's just my take on you know I've got three boys that could be the possibility. Rand's the only one who wasn't actually born in the two rivers, and he would be the best candidate at this point. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think she's done the math there already. Does she know that Rand's the one that wasn't born in the two rivers? She's or is already, she still just she knows that one of them. Well, remember way back when we left and we're talking to Algamar, like she made a point that most of these boys were from Manathar and blood. Right. She knows that one of the boys is not. Oh, yeah, but, but does she, she doesn't know. know which we don't one. know for certain. Hmm, I don't know. Maybe I'm doing the math wrong, but I still get a sense that I think Maureen knew. Or at it's least entirely very possible. Likely. I mean, we'll find out in the next, no, two chapters from now, um, that in hindsight, she looks back and she's like, oh, I should have known it was you because of this, that, and the other. Um, so it's possible that her um, subconscious is already working Probably. through all that problem solving, but she just hasn't like grasped it into her um, consciousness yet. Right. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if she knows it's Rand. I mean, she might. She absolutely might. But I'm not 100% sure that she does. On a side note, okay, <laughs> I kind of get why Rand has so many trust issues with her after this. I mean, uh, yeah. But at the same time, I also get why Maureen didn't just come out straight up and tell him the truth. I mean, it's frustrating. It's complicated. And at the end of the day, it's good writing because it just, it's very compelling. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if I was in the situation, which way I would go. Do I want to know? Do I not want to know? I think Maureen had a hard place, a hard decision to make here. Well, I think that Moraine made the right decision in this situation because Rand was not ready to hear it. Right. I mean, let's be honest. Like he totally wields the power and, you know, defeats the forsaken. Like he full on channels and he's still not ready to believe it. Yeah. You know? So like, there's no way that he would have been able to accept what she was saying if she tried to tell him. So, but he still resents her for it. So yeah. And, I understand that. Totally. So Aganar explains that, quote, some of us are bound no longer. The seals weaken, Ace and I. Like Ishmael, we walk the world again, and soon the rest of us will come. End quote. I'm not sure which Forsaken are out at this point. Um, they're all out by book three, but some are definitely still bound here. And I tried to do some research and I I couldn't really find a timeline of when they were released. Yeah, which one is which? Um, if I had to guess, I would say Lanfear is probably free. Um, and maybe Raven or Semarog, maybe? Okay. Um, but other than Ishmael and now Aginor and Bothamal, like we don't have any proof that any of them are loose. Right. But I'm I've got a really strong feeling that Lanfear is out and about at this point. 
I would agree with you. Uh, so I agree with you that Landfair and Samrog have got to be out at this point. Okay. And showing my work on that because I don't have any real concrete evidence. Right. Um, I don't think, I mean, just from a timeline standpoint, we see the, Son- the Sean Chan show up. Mm-hmm. With the whole return and the Korean, all that fun stuff. Mm-hmm. And Semarog has worked herself into a high place in that society. Yeah, like, isn't she truth speaker for right. Tuan? Correct. So she's she's not just, you know, some highly elevated person. She is right up next to the royal family. Yeah, and I know she took over when the old truth speaker was killed. Yes. Um... And I don't, but I don't know how she got into that place. But yeah, it would make sense that it would take some time to set that up. Right. And more, more time than passes between here and that event. Yeah. So, and that's somewhere in book three. Correct. It's a very brief reference, but it's in book three. So, so. I think she's definitely out doing her thing on the other side of the ocean. Uh-huh. Um, I think Landfair's out because uh, I. Just think that she's she's one of the trickiest forsaken of them all, and yeah. she's really good at like staying in the shadows and hiding. Mm-hmm. Um, so even if she's out and about, you're not going to see evidence of her. Well, when she first got out, she spent most of her time in the dream world anyway. Right. So because that's that's her that's and her then place. messing with Rand because right of course. <laughs> and then Ishmael, I'm not sure why, but he gets kicked out and he gets spun out by the wheel every so often as it is. So yeah, I, he was only partially bound, so right. he's. He's, we've already discussed that he's Bowsman, so he's been wreaking havoc this whole time. So he's free to go. So, yeah. I mean, so we know Ishmael's out. I'm almost, I'm like 99% certain Simrog is out. I'm convinced Landfair's out. And then we got these two, so. And possibly Raffin, because of the, like, uproar in Camelin. Right. Um, we talked about he may be partially responsible, but it could also be Ishmael who's responsible. Just so, so like and chaos. then he just like when Raven was released, he sort of took advantage of the situation that was already there. Right. So he might not be out. Like maybe he comes out later. So if Raven is not out at this point, then he just piggybacks on some of the chaos that Ishmael show, has sown in Camelin. But right. it's still, I still find it very plausible I don't have, again, no evidence to show it, Mm -hmm. that the kind of upset and unrest we see in Camelin with the White Cloaks and everybody when Logan goes through Mm -hmm. could probably be the beginnings of the stirrings that Robin is kind of already sowing as he makes his ploy. But I don't know if Robin's that smart or that far ahead thinking. He probably just piggybacked off of Ishmael. Yeah. Yeah. It it honestly could go either way. Yeah, so he's right, obviously his, out by book three because that's yeah. when we see him. But um, so at this point, he's a toss up, and yeah. probably just assume that he's not. But definitely Samarog, definitely Lamphere, and then these two. So so we got five out, counting yes. Ishmael. Yeah, five of the thirteen. Five of thirteen. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> He also says, quote, I was too close to this world in my captivity, I and Bothamel, too close to the grinding of the wheel. But soon the great lord of the dark will be free and give us new flesh, and the world will be ours once more. End quote. So this brings up the whole forsaken reincarnation thing. Yeah. I am not a fan. Really? No, when they started getting reborn, it just felt like cheating. It kind of was. You know, it was like, are you kidding me? We have to deal with this guy again. But to be fair, the rules are laid out right here. So we should have known that it was a possibility. Already, Lan is torn between Maureen and Nynaeve as far as who to protect. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a huge deal because he can feel pain when Maureen gets hurt. Yeah. And if she dies, he goes crazy. Yeah. Like, Like he's screwed if she dies. Yeah, Warder's... Don't usually survive their Ace Sedai very long. Mm-mm. So the fact that he even hesitates at all it shows that he loves Nynaeve. Yeah, absolutely. And then when Lan is thrown into the stone archway, Nynaeve attacks Agenor. Huh. And it reminded me of that episode of Buffy when she says, 
You can attack me. You can send assassins after me. That's fine. But nobody messes with my boyfriend. (laughs) God, I love that show. Right? And, of course, the women still only have belt knives. Right. So Nynaeve is attacking the Forsaken with, like, essentially a freaking steak knife. (laughs) Like, she is fierce as hell, but not always the smartest. You know, love makes you do the wacky. Apparently. (laughs) Okay. I want to take a minute and talk about the threat of sexual violence in fiction. Okay, yeah. So this is not specific to the fantasy genre, but in general, can we stop using rape as our go-to plot device? Yeah. Every time you turn around, some female character is either getting raped or molested or otherwise being threatened with sexual violence. And the thing about fiction is that It is 100% the choice of the author. Yeah. And, like, I'm not saying that a person can never write sexual violence, but maybe it shouldn't be quite so automatic. I mean, even in The Wheel of Time, which is pretty mild compared to other fantasy stories, there are a ton of references to women getting raped. Yeah. Almost all of it happens off screen, thankfully, so we're not subjected to, like, a play-by-play of the violence, but... It's still in there, and most of it is completely unnecessary. In this scene, Balthamal is already digging his fingers into Nynaeve's flesh as he suspends her by the throat. Yeah. You know, like, the blood is mentioned. You know, it's, 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 it's violent. Is a rape threat really needed on top of that? Because I don't think it is. You know, he's a bad guy. We get it. And I'm not saying that you can never write about sexual violence, but it should be treated with care and not used as a cheap and easy plot convenience or the way to show that a character is bad. It's lazy writing. And it's not helping anyone. You know, like, people need to take the time and be a better writer than having to resort to using sexual violence as a trope. And... Even Jordan fails, and he falls into this trap, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm just sick of it. I'm so sick of it. And again, it's across all genres. It's mm-hmm. books, it's TV shows, it's movies, it's, you know, it's everything from fantasy and sci-fi to romance. Like, it's ridiculous, and it's freaking everywhere. Yeah. And I'm so over it. Like, no, no. This is just lazy and cheap. And completely unnecessary. One of the frustrations I have, not necessarily with the books themselves, but actually with, I guess, a few of the interactions I've had with some of the fandom. Like, there's, I mean, we've already talked about how awesome it is that we have this overarching theme of men and women. The greatest things happen when men and women work together. Yeah. And there, there are some things that Wheel of Time does that, especially for its time, we're really forward thinking. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, we have things like this. Right. So, like, there's... And a, I mean, again, Jordan is not the worst offender by far. Right, right. You know, I'm not saying that he is. I'm just saying all of us collectively, can we not? And the thing that I kind of wanted to mention is that you can still have a book that does things right and wrong at the same time. And I think yeah. this is one of the things that as fans of the, uh, as, as fans, we need to not cover over certain things and not shy away from things. Cause we want to, lo- we love this material mm-hmm. and we want to celebrate it for its, for its accomplishments, mm-hmm. but we need to not shy away from saying, and it's not perfect. Yeah, like, as a fan, you can still be a fan of something. You can still love something yes. while simultaneously acknowledging its faults. Exactly. And that's kind of what I wanted to, like, say. And that's, I mean, we wouldn't be doing this podcast if we didn't love this series. But you're right. This is a pretty big glaring problem with The Wheel of Time and other things as well. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, Robert Jordan is not the biggest offender by any means, you know? Right. Like, he actually is really, really mild in comparison. (laughs) But the point is, even in something so mild, it's still in there all over the place. It is. You know, you've got this, you've got references later to 
uh, Marigel yeah. raping women. You've got um, just all sorts of stuff. I mean, there's the the blaring ones like more gays. My God, yes. Um, yes. But like, uh, like Elaine gets attacked a couple times. Like, yep. I mean, it's everywhere, and it's it's not necessary. You know, again, this is one hundred percent the choice of the author. author. So you'd say, oh, well, no, that this needed to happen because of this, that, and the other. And it's like, no, 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 I'm sorry. That is wrong. The author wrote it that way, you know? Yeah. And I'm really, really sick of a woman having to be victimized in order for the male main character to have some sort of emotional growth. Right. It's like, no, nah, dude, you got to figure that out a different way. Like, come on, author, get it together. I just... I may be a little bit passionate about this subject, but I'm just sick of it. I'm <laughs> so sick of it. Like just across the board with fiction in general, cut it out. You know, Agreed. I'm going to step off my soapbox now. <laughs> oh, that's where that is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I love that when Perrin and Matt attack, Matt calls out wisdom. Yeah. It's a way of expressing that Nynaeve is a part of them. They don't call Nynaeve by name. You know, they don't say mm-hmm. Nynaeve. Nope. They say wisdom, which yeah. is a community title. She's their wisdom. And when the Forsaken mess with her, they're messing with all of them. Like, this is one of the more moving parts of this whole chapter for me. It's mm-hmm. like, because Matt's character at this point has been so just messed over and corrupted by the dagger and, right. and all kinds of stuff. And yeah. we have not seen much of that same person who took care of Rand back on the road to Camelon. Yeah. But nine even peril is the thing that brings out the true Matt and he will risk his life for her without question. Oh, absolutely. He yeah. does many times. Yeah. He's very, very loyal to nine. Even, even though he complains about her constantly. Um, you know, Matt's one of those characters. It's like what I do, not what I say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, he will 100% risk his life for her, no problem. So the way the green man kills Balthamal is really hardcore. Yeah. It's a gruesome death. Uh-huh. Creepers are bursting through him and fungus and spores are growing out of him. It's nasty and painful. Yep. Like, he deserves it. Obviously, but still, yikes. Yeah, the Green Man's attack on Bathamel is one of the most beautiful and at the same time most disgusting things I've ever read. Yeah. Like, the Green Man is a force of nature manifested. And sometimes I forget that nature has a lot of really gross, creepy crawlers that thrive and (laughs) flourish in dark places. Yeah. It's fitting that this is how Bathamel dies. The Green Man unleashes all of these things on him, and he is literally devoured by them. Mm-hmm. For me, Jordan always walks the line between being too graphic and just graphic enough, and this is an example of him navigating that line very well. True, yeah. So the Green Man dies in a blaze of glory, and we get this line. Burned leaves fell from his arm as he painfully stretched out his blackened hand to gently cup an acorn. And all I can think as this acorn magically grows into a massive oak is, I am Groot. (laughs) Certain things have ruined me forever. Dude, that's messed up. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So, yeah. Yeah, that's me. Okay. Okay. (laughs) This chapter delivers on something that we have not seen yet in this book. Magic users fighting against other magic users. Oh, yeah. We've seen magic used against Trollocs and Fades, but never against other channelers. Mm -hmm. The Green Man has his own form of magic, and Maureen uses the power against the Forsaken. And the showdown does not disappoint. Like, the magic in the Wheel of Time is really well done, and I can't wait to see this battle play out on the TV show. Oh, totally. This is going to be fun. That brings us to the end of Chapter 50. Before we get to chapter 51, here's a quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode of the Wheel of Time Pod Through is brought to you by disembodied voices that speak in capital letters. Could it be the creator? The dark one? Rod Serling? We may never know. Disembodied voices that speak in capital letters, starting internet wars since the 90s. Chapter 51 is called Against the Shadow, and the icon is the sword. 
Rand runs away and straight towards a cliff. When he turns to find a better way, Agnor is there. He looks better, as if he's fed on something. He says that he doesn't want to share power with Rand, and it doesn't matter if Rand serves the Dark One alive or dead. As he advances, Rand senses a brilliant golden rope of light running off of Agnor. It calls to Rand. One bright finger strand lifted away and touched him. Light filled him, and Agnor screams, No, you shall not have it. It's mine. Mine? 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 And then they enter the staring contest of doom while they mentally fight for supremacy over the light cord thing. Agnor draws too much of the power and burns himself up. Rand accidentally teleports himself to Tarwin's Gap in the middle of the battlefield while both sides are trying to regroup. The humans are losing and the battle will not be going on for much longer. The dark forces spot him and attack. Lightning comes down to strike Dragkar. Rings of fire and waves of rent earth decimate the Trolloc army. Rand shouts, The light blind you, Balsma, and this has to end, and is answered with a disembodied voice that speaks in capital letters. It is not here. I will take no part. Only the chosen one can do what must be done if he will. It was not Rand's thought. He asks the voice, Where? And it answers again, Not here. And a stairway to the sky appears. The stairs lead to Balsman in a dreamscape, and Rand senses a black cord coming out of him. After some macho posturing and Balsman telling Rand that he could have killed him but would rather Rand bow to him and serve willingly instead, visions of Nynaeve, Egwin, and Cariel Thor appear. Rand denies that they are real, and the girls disappear, but Rand's mother stays and begs for Rand's help. Mirdrils surround and torture her, and Rand creates a sword of light to attack them. After saving his mom, Rand uses the sword of light to cut Balsman's black cord. The ends spring apart and whip Balsman back into the fireplace. As he burns, the dreamscape starts to fall apart. Rand falls painfully back to reality. It's easy to forget just how confusing some of the things at the end of this book are. If you're reading for the first time. Or the second, or the fourth. <laughs> yeah, like, okay, so Agonar starts talking about the Lord of the Morning and the Hall of the Servants, as if Rand has any clue what he's talking about. Um, having completed the story, we know that Luz Theron Talamon's nickname was Lord of the Morning, and that the Hall of the Servants was where the Aes Sedai of his age met, like they do in this age in the White Tower. Sometimes I do wish that I can go back and reread the series for the first time, but these two chapters are an exception. I'm still not sure I understand everything that's going on here after reading the whole series many times. Yeah, straight up, this chapter makes no sense. It's a complete anomaly, and it doesn't fit with the rest of the series. You know, one thing that makes The Wheel of Time such a great series is that the magic system has rules. Yeah. You know, like, once we get past book one... There is a rational magic system that everyone follows where some things are possible and some things are not. Uh And everything is clear and defined. But this chapter is crazy town. It's just hand-wavy nonsense, and I am not a fan. Yeah. So Okay, so we get this quote. A glowing rope ran off Agonor behind him, white like sunlight seen through the purest clouds, heavier than a blacksmith's arm, lighter than air, connecting the Forsaken to something distant beyond knowing. Rand sees Agonor's connection to the power that has been stored in the eye of the world, and it's pure white. Later, the contrast between the white cord and the black cord that he sees is pivotal because it'll come into play in important ways. But the groundwork for that understanding is set here, all the way back in book one. So just for clarity, the white rope slash cord thing coming off of Agonor is his connection to the pure Sedin that had been in the eye of the world. Right. And Rand is able to tap into that when the cord touches him. That's why he's able to channel so much during this battle. Right. Um, Rand seems to be the only one who can see these cords throughout the series. And it only comes up a couple times. Though... I did see that Brandon Sanderson said that it is possible for someone else to be trained to see the cords. So it's not necessarily unique to Rand in theory. Okay. I did some research and it is confirmed that the black cord that Rand sees attached to 
Ishii slash Bowsman is the connection to the Dark One that allows the male Forsaken to channel without going mad. Okay. So cutting the black cord means removing the Dark One's protection and that Forsaken would no longer be able to channel Sedin without going mad. Okay. And we'll see this in the future. Like, so in the future, Ran, the only other time really that this cord thing comes up is when um, Rand is fighting Asmodian. And he cuts Asmodian's cord. And so Asmodian can still technically channel Sedin, but if he does, he's going to go mad because his protection, like his connection to the Dark One has been severed. Got it. Okay. Now, in Ishmael's case, because he prefers to channel the uh, true power? Yeah, the Dark One power? Right. The Dark dark One's power, whatever. I can't remember which one it is at the moment. Um, like, it doesn't really matter, because he doesn't... I mean, he he can channel Sedin still, but he doesn't really want to. He likes using the other power instead. Uh, but um, it comes at a cost. Yeah, but, I mean, that's why he doesn't go Sedin mad. <laughs> I mean, he has his own kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we'll right. talk about that in a later book. Uh, but he... Uh, so he still is able to channel because he's using this other power instead of Sedin. So this black cord is specifically linked to Sedin, which is why Rand doesn't see cords coming out of any of the female Forsaken. Right. Okay. Because they don't need the protection. Right. Huh. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up. Mm-hmm. I did research. <laughs> so Rand is magically transported to Tarwin's Gap. As the Borderland forces are about to be overrun by the Trollock army. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how he gets there, but Rand basically saves the day by wiping out most of the invading forces. Mm-hmm. He just slaughters them. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, enough for the humans <laughs> to prevail in the battle. What I like about this is the way that Rand just lays waste to the Dark One's forces with lightning and fire and earth. He just destroys a crap ton of bad guys using the power of the eye of the world. It's amazing. Totally. Then things get weird. Wait, then they get weird? They weren't weird already? (laughs) Yeah. Okay, sure. Then they get weird. (laughs) (laughs) So we get a a section of text that's in all caps. And Rand Mm. screams that this has to end. And the response simply is, it's not here. When Rand asks where it must end, we get this answer of, I will take no part. Only the chosen one can do what must be done. If he will, which is so cryptic that to this day, people online argue about what it means. But in in response to asking where a second time stairs appear and then Rand gets taken up into the sky where we meet Biasma. The opinion shared by most people on the Internet is that the creator is intervening and letting Rand know that this is not the end of his journey. Mm hmm. I kind of believe that the all caps letters are actually Ishmael. Like he's still trying to play it being the dark one and he's leading Rand into the sky for their big fight. Because the next thing that happens is that Rand finds Ishmael slash Biazamon in this dreamscape uh-huh. that he's transported into. Um, okay. So I think that's a really interesting theory, but I don't think I agree with you. Okay. Um, I, I don't think that it makes sense for the voice to be Ishi slash Bailsman because of him saying, I will take no part. Like, that just doesn't make sense. Because obviously, Ishmael is taking no part. Um, Robert Jordan refused to answer any questions about the voice. And Brandon Sanderson has danced around the issue as well, saying that Jordan wanted some of these things to stay mysterious. Okay. So the real answer is that there is no answer. <laughs> but for my money, I think it makes the most sense that the voice is the creator. Um, the capital letters come back for the last battle. Oh, yeah. Basically telling Rand, yep, now's the time. So technically, it could be a number of possibilities. But I'm pretty sure that the voice is the creator. But to be honest, this doesn't make sense. (laughs) And like, 
this is going to offend some people. I can just hear the Twitter happening. Uh Uh-oh, here it comes. Okay, so, I mean, Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson can say, oh, it's meant to be mysterious so that for years to come, fans will still have something to ponder. All they want to, but the truth is, I think Robert Jordan realized as he was writing book two, book three, oh, damn, I I made a mistake. <laughs> and to cover up that he made a mistake, he's like, no, it's a mystery. And <laughs> like seriously, I, I really think that by the time, you know, his books got super popular and he started doing interviews and people started asking him about it, he had made the decision of I'm going to say it's supposed to be a mystery and if I work it out later, I work it out, but if not, that's fine. But I really think this was a mistake. I think he messed up. I just do, because it makes no sense. It doesn't jive with the rest of the series. There's no religion in Ranland. Like, they talk about the creator and how he takes no part, how he's totally hands-off. He created the world and walked away. Right. Like a gardener who had planted many gardens. Like, it's in there. So it doesn't make sense for this to be here. I mean, what did he, yeah. what was he doing? Like, what is this? You know, I will 100% back you on the he had to backpedal. Because when he originally sold the series, like, it was only going to be, like, four some odd books. It wasn't going to be this huge, big, epic 14 some odd book Yeah, it, thing. it was supposed to be a trilogy, right? So I'm fairly certain that he had a plan, but then it changed. Which is fine. That and that's happens. Fine. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, like, I don't fault him for going from three books to 14. Like, that's fine. Mostly. But it <laughs> would be nice to have a much more clear answer. And, okay, so I know that recently, I think, I don't know if it was this year or probably, probably the previous year at JordanCon, Brandon Sanderson basically told everybody, look, there are mysteries in this book, in this series that, I'm not allowed to tell you about Mm -hmm. because Robert Jordan, basically, I guess you'd call it a time capsule. He has certain mysteries that are not allowed to be revealed until a certain number of years have passed. So I'm willing to lay money that we find out what's actually going on here when that time capsule gets released. I disagree. And I really hope I, I honestly that you're don't right. think this is going to be one of them. <laughs> like, I do think there are other mysteries in the series that will be revealed. Hopefully, Nakomi? Nakoma? N- Nakomi? N- yeah, Nakomi. Hopefully, that'll be answered. That would be awesome. Because I don't know what that was about either. Um, but, like, I honestly do not think this is ever going to be resolved. Because. I swear it was a mistake. Because as much as we want <laughs> to hold authors up, as much as we want to hold our favorite authors up to this pedestal and this like standard, they are human. And it would be interesting to find out that, yeah, this was just a human mistake. Yeah. And like, I mean, even if it, I mean, okay, let me try this again. Whether it was or wasn't a mistake, Jordan repeatedly said, I'm not telling you. It's a mystery. It will be a mystery. Just let it be mysterious. And I think that's the mistake. Yeah. So I don't think that he ever intended for that mystery to ever be revealed. I don't think that it's part of this quote unquote time capsule thing. Like, I don't think that's ever going to be resolved. I think that's something Jordan made the decision that it will be shrouded in mystery until the end of time. And, you know, so... Argue about it online, man. That's all we can do. That's what the internet is for. <laughs> so my theory is it's the creator because it's the only thing that makes sense to me, even though none of it makes sense. So Teresa doesn't have a Twitter. You can't at her. Yeah, don't um, at me. But definitely at <laughs> us. And we'd love to hear we'd love to hear your thoughts. One of the things about uh, majoring in biblical studies in college is that certain things kind of stand out to me as similar to certain Bible stories. Okay. So what I've kind of referred to as the temptation of Rand mirrors the temptation of Christ here. Well, at least in my mind. Okay. Rand is presented with the opportunity to kneel before Beelzebub, and he will be given power over kingdoms. And his response is to say that the will weaves the pattern, not Beelzebub. Then Beazman says that it doesn't matter if he's alive or dead. Rand denies him, and it's as not having power over his own soul. 
Then Beelzebub offers him a chance to save his mother, Cariel Thor, who died before he really ever had a chance to know her. And Rand's response is to deny Beelzebub and refuse to serve him. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but we definitely are setting up a savior here. Yeah. I mean, he's definitely a chosen one, and a lot of times the chosen one uh, story is, is, a, is a savior story. You know, like a Christ-like story. Rand is tapping a ton of the power. Yeah. So much so that Balsman warns him that he could burn himself out. He conjures a sword of light and cuts Balsman's black cord, which snaps him back into the fireplace. Then Rand points his sword at Balsman's chest, and light comes out of the blade and joins the flames that, are, uh, that were in the fireplace. The dreamscape burns... And Rand uses up the last of the Pyrsidin that was in the pool. And then he just kind of falls back into reality. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm going to say it again. Any chapter that requires this much research and questioning and arguing is badly written. I love this series. And I think Jordan was a good writer. But I think he made a misstep here. Like, he was trying to write too much in metaphor and symbolism, and this chapter doesn't make sense. And maybe I'm in the minority here, but it just it doesn't work for me. It just doesn't. And like we were saying before, you can love something and still acknowledge the mistakes. Mm. Like, I love Harry Potter, the entire Harry Potter series. Love it, love it, love it. I read it once a year. But the epilogue, huge mistake on Rowling's part. It was terrible. And me admitting that that epilogue was crap does not take away my love of the series. So me saying that this chapter is terrible and badly written (laughs) and a mistake on Jordan's part does not mean that I don't love the series. It does not mean that I don't love this book. Like, The Eye of the World is actually one of my favorites of the series. But this chapter is terrible. That's my opinion. What do you think? I am with you that this, like especially the first time I read this, I was very much. I, I was just. I was over. I was overloaded with information, and, and I it just, was confusing. And but I walked away with a sense of this means something. It, this is th- there's something here that I must understand. And reread after reread after reread later, I've come to the same conclusion. Like no. No, there's nothing to understand here. This actually, this is an anomaly and nothing else in the rest of the series works anything like any of the stuff we see here. Yeah. And like, that's the thing. I don't know about you, but I've read this book a lot. Yeah. This is not my first, second, even third time through this chapter. Like, I've probably read this chapter a good five or six times and it still doesn't make any sense. Even having read the rest of the series and knowing how the entire story takes place, this still doesn't make any sense, which means something. Like, that says a lot about whether or not this chapter is successful. Yeah. But I think we've hit this one again and again pretty hard. And I'm 100% in agreement with you that I don't think this chapter is successful. But I still love this book. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's what I think. And that ends chapter 50 and 51 of The Eye of the World. Join us next week for 52 and 53, where we finish the book. Yay! We hope that you enjoyed this episode of The Wheel of Time Pot Through. We'll see you again next week. Make sure you rate and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Maybe leave us a positive review. It really does help us out. You can tweet us at WattPodThrough or email us at WattPodThrough at gmail.com or tell us your thoughts on anything we covered today. That's W-O-T-P-O-D-T-H-R-U at gmail.com. Don't forget to send us your questions for the Q&A episode. Yes. Thanks, everybody. And we hope the wheel weaves you in our direction again soon. Where it's time to get down to the business and save the world. Let's get down to business to defeat 
Dun-dun-duns. Sorry, I was singing. What? Or, or something. 